Max owned three pairs of shoes, no more, no less. When he ran into any shoe-related issues, he would discard that pair and buy another as a replacement. The important thing is that he always, at any given moment, owned three pairs of shoes. This was a constant of the universe, whether Max knew it or not. The first pair was black and by far the most worn. Their shininess had long since vanished, and they were purchased for the sole reason of being shoes to wear. They fit his feet comfortably, and Max was happy with that. They were nothing special. The second pair was white and almost exclusively worn to walk to shoe shops whenever a new pair was needed. These were the backup pair, while shinier, cleaner, and by all accounts simply better. Max would never dream of wearing these daily. He couldn't even recall how he had come into possession of them. They served their purpose of existing and nothing more. The third pair was also black but pointier at the ends. These were the fancy shoes. Actually, they were the same price as his main pair, but they just looked a little fancier. These are worn to weddings or any other event that called for the need for pointy shoes. In Max's case, this was not very often. They had been worn a total of three times, and one of those was to make sure they fit. Three Shoe Max worked as a data analyst at a multinational company. He had always been good with numbers, and while his dream job was something that inspired his creativity a little more, he was content with his line of work. Katie, who worked at a desk right near his, was someone Max was always fond of. They had been on a date before, the third time Max had ever worn his fancy shoes. But ultimately, things just didn't work out. They still spoke and laughed, but Max always wanted something more than what they had. Perhaps in another reality was the final thing Katie had ever said on the matter. A sudden... Max didn't find as much comfort in this as she had intended. Max saw this almost as an insult, a way of telling him that they were worlds apart and that she could never be with him. Katie saw this as a way of telling him that a different set of circumstances could have led to a different outcome. While Max wanted more out of life, he didn't plan to do anything to change it. That was too much of a fuss for him. Besides, this was, of course, the only path his life could have possibly led to. Max's daily routine rarely altered. He would wake up, get ready, put on his shoes, the first pair, and walk to work. After he got back home, he would watch something on the television while eating and go to bed. The weekends were largely spent cleaning the apartment and watching more television. Unknown to Max, even minutes before it occurred, a small change in his routine would change his life forever. One day, before work, his main pair of shoes broke. They had been worn one too many times, and simply gave in. Max didn't have time to get another pair before work. He put on his white backup pair, knowing that he would march down to the shoe shop as soon as he clocked out of work. Once he got to the building, however, something strange happened. Something three-shoe Max found even stranger than wearing a white pair of shoes. A supply closet near his desk seemed to be glowing slightly, curious as to what could be happening. He took a deep breath, opened up the door, and stepped inside. Max owned seven pairs of shoes. No more, no less. When he ran into any shoe-related issues, he would discard that pair and buy another as a replacement. The important thing is that he always, at any given moment, owned seven pairs of shoes. This was a constant of the universe, whether Max knew it or not. Each of the seven pairs was very different, and each had its unique purpose. They all got worn equally, for equally important reasons. Some were brightly colored, others were dull. Some were sporty, others were fancy. 
Max may not have owned a great deal of shoes, but he was happy with his small collection. Seven Shoe Max worked as a sports columnist for a national newspaper. He enjoyed letting his creativity flow into his work, writing about things in his own words, using his own thoughts. Max could not dream of anything better. Growing up, he had always been good with numbers, but something so factory-like was never appealing to him. He didn't want to be a cog in a machine. He wanted to be the machine. From his job, he met his wife, Katie. She worked as a data analyst at a firm that had been contracted for a job relating to Max's section of the newspaper. After a single date, they knew that they were great for each other. Not a single reality exists where we aren't together, Katie said about a month before she passed away. Max had his life flipped on his head. His perfect seven-shoe life became a zero-shoe life as he stopped going out or seeing anybody at all. He fell behind at his job. They only kept him on because he had shown years of commitment. But he was so very close to being let go, like he had let the world go. He stopped wearing his wedding ring. He loved Katie, but couldn't bear the reminder of her passing. Eventually, he tried to go back to work. On this day in particular, however, he heard a strange sound coming from his spare bedroom as he was about to leave the house. Perhaps he wanted an excuse to stay home, or perhaps he simply expected the worst, as he had done ever since Katie's passing. Regardless of reasoning or motive, he grabbed a knife and slowly opened the spare bedroom door. Three Shoe Max found himself standing in the dark closet. What had been glowing just a moment ago now seemed somehow void of any light. Turning back around to leave, he found the door to feel different. It was now smooth, cold to the touch, and almost glossy. As he pushed it open, the light that spilled onto him was not from the bustling office environment he had just entered from, but instead a well-kept, seemingly unused bedroom. It was only then that Three Shoe Max noticed the clothes touching him. He was in a wardrobe. He stepped out. Perplexed would be an understatement. How had the room changed? Forget that. How had the building changed? This was a quiet home. He wanted to go back. He didn't want to be a part of something he couldn't comprehend. He had already gone against his routine by wearing white shoes. Getting lost in a strange, magical wardrobe was not penciled into his schedule. As he pressed at the back of the wardrobe for some kind of hidden doorway, he accidentally knocked some clothes onto the floor. Their hangers clattered together, making a bang. He knew that if someone was home right now, they probably heard him. He started trying to think of how to explain his situation. I entered from a glowing supply closet on the fifth floor of an office building. Somehow didn't sound believable, despite him living those exact events. As it turns out, a believable explanation was not needed. As the bedroom door creaked slowly open, Max saw himself standing there. Three Shoe Max didn't even notice the knife, and Seven Shoe Max forgot about it the moment he dropped it to the floor, despite it narrowly avoiding his feet. The two stood there for a brief moment, anticipating the other to speak. Who are you? Seven Shoe Max broke the silence. Max, an answer that anyone could have expected. How? How is this possible? There was this glowing supply closet and... Three Shoe Max gestured to the wardrobe, still unsure of how to explain anything. He noticed a small framed photo hanging on the wall. Max and Katie. Katie, you're married to her. Seven Shoe Max didn't answer. She'd find that interesting to know, Three Shoe Max thought aloud. This got his attention. Katie is alive. Where is she? Through the wardrobe? My Katie is, he spoke as Seven Shoe Max pushed past him to get to the wardrobe. Katie, can you hear me? He pushed at the back as Three Shoe Max had also tried. It was still no avail. Katie, it's me. We're not together. 
Max turned back to look at Max. She's dead here. We were married. We are married. But she's gone. I'm sorry to hear that. But I need to get back. I don't know where I am. Suddenly, bursting through the bedroom door, came Five Shoe Max. Max, don't freak out. But I'm you. I think I'm in another universe. I've been here for a few hours, so I came to... Wait, what? Five Shoe Max noticed there were already two Maxes here. Do you know a Katie? Seven Shoe Max asked urgently. Of course she's my partner. I fell into her wardrobe to borrow some shoes and ended up in some newspaper company. I left before anyone saw me. Seven Shoe Max let out an audible sob. Katie alive but uninterested. Katie alive and sharing shoes. Anything seemed better than his situation. She's dead here. This is his universe and she's dead. Three Shoe Max caught the new one up. After calming down and chatting for a while about how to return home, they all got onto the subject of their lives. Three Shoe Max in particular began to wonder if he even mattered at all. If the multiverse means he is only one of infinite, how can anything truly matter? He didn't speak this aloud. He just wondered it silently in his head. He wasn't one to speak his opinions or thoughts. Five Shoe. Max explained that he and Katie were going through a rough spot. I think she wants me to propose, but I don't know if I want to. I feel almost pressured. How dare you! Seven Shoe Max spoke with a louder voice than usual. She is everything. How could you even entertain that idea? Do you have any idea how lucky you are to still have her? I know, but... He paused to think. He knew it was true. He appreciated her a great deal. But was she right for him? A silence fell over them as they all contemplated their unique situations. If the multiverse is infinite, this right here was proof that they are each their own individual. The same DNA, the same name, yet vastly different minds. These were not three Maxes. They were Max, Max and Max, each independent of one another. Three Shoe Max interrupted these thoughts by speaking. Katie doesn't even want to be with me where I come from, and I think that's okay. We're friends, and I'm lucky to have her in my life, but I shouldn't dictate how I feel based on how she feels about me. The fact that you both fell for her doesn't mean anything for me. I'm not you. I can live with being a different Max and living a different story. Five Shoe Max continued this emotional opening. I'm going to propose. I know deep down that I want to. The patch we're going through right now is scary, but I know that things will work out. We always come back on top. A scary adventure is better than no adventure. I'm lucky I get to have that adventure with someone I care about. Seven Shoe Max took a little longer before he spoke. I miss Katie. I miss her so so deeply. I want to see her again. But I feel better knowing that others still get to experience being around her. Her warm smile, her contagious laughter, they do not belong to me. They belong to her. I am glad you both have the honor that she has shared that with you. She has chosen to let you both into her life in different ways, and I hope neither of you take that for granted. Soon, the wardrobe began to glow. Each Max said their goodbyes, knowing that while they may never meet again, the lessons they had learned from one another would forever stick true. They had each discovered how to look at themselves from a new perspective, knowing that the only life worth living is the one you live yourself. Oh, and Three Shoe Max bought a fourth pair of shoes. Once, twice, thrice, did you know that those are the only words of their type? There is no quadris or anything of the sort. After thrice, there is nothing. I find it odd that our language doesn't have a word like this for every number. But even odder is that we even bothered to invent thrice at all. It is not a commonly spoken word, 
not outside of Witchford anyway. A broken clock is right thrice a day, a spin on a classic saying, yet one with its meaning opaque to outsiders. I invite you to learn of the saying's origin as I walk you through the events that transpired last summer in a place I can never bring myself to go back to. The clock tower stood tall in the British village of Witchford, visible from any street, not exactly a huge feat when your village only has six streets, but it still stood proudly at the centre. It was always able to see you. Lights behind the clock faces illuminated them at night, easy to mistake for the moon at a quick glance of the skyline. Their harsh white glow, a reminder of the passing minutes. The hourly chimes echo this to those even without a direct line of sight. If anything about Witchford was eerie to newcomers, this clock tower was it. To me, though, it was just there to tell me when my shift ended. The local corner store I worked at had a window directly facing this tower. One day, on a Saturday, at precisely one hour and seven minutes past noon, the hands stopped moving. I did not notice until a customer I was serving chuckled slightly. I can't believe it's been one hour and seven minutes for nearly an hour. Her sarcastic tone still not cluing into what exactly she meant. I did not clock onto the joke until she showed me her watch and gestured towards the clock tower. Sure enough, it was two o'clock, yet the tower told otherwise. Well, I guess it'll be right again tomorrow, I joked. Twice if we're lucky. On her way out, she told me that she was going to inform Tobias. I'm sure he already knows, but there's no harm in me just making sure... Tobias was the clock keeper, his house attached to the tower. I have never been inside, so I am not sure whether he technically lived in the tower or next door. I suppose that depends on whether the buildings connect internally. Either way, the tower was his responsibility, as it had been for the past fifty years since his father tragically died after falling from the tower. At five o'clock, as I finished work, I heard the familiar five chimes, seeming to confirm that the tower had been fixed. I never stopped to realize that the chimes continued to be eerily missing the rest of the day, nor did I look at the tower. In the morning the next day, as I left my house for a walk in the summer heat, I saw that the clock tower still read one hour and seven minutes, despite hearing the three chimes the day prior. My walk always consists of walking down all six streets, stopping to say hello to anybody I pass on the way. It is only a fifteen-minute walk, unless the conversations delay it. On this day, though, the air felt quiet, even for a small village like Witchford. Things felt particularly more melancholy than normal. By the end of my walk, I had not seen a single person. That was as I got to the final street the one that goes right through the centre of our village, right past the clock tower. I could see Rob, Witchford's lone police officer, standing at the doorway. His hat was held solemnly in his hands, a gesture that he reserves usually only for church services. By the time I got to the clock tower, he had gone to sit in his car. I could hear other officers on his radio, confirming that they were on their way to the location. His car window had been rolled down, so I stopped to say hello. Morning, I spoke with care to remove emotion from my voice. I did not know what had happened or how serious the situation was. If something bad had happened, I did not want to be the oblivious twat who walks in and asks, Why the long face? He seemed to not even notice me until I had spoken. Hey, uh, hey. Yeah, morning to you too. Is everything okay? Yeah, his words not matching his mannerisms. Well, things will be okay. He looked pale. I did not know what he had seen, but it had spooked him to his core. Before I even got the chance to ask further, he answered with what he knew I was curious about. We're going to have to announce it soon anyway, so he stepped out of his car and stood beside me. Three bodies were just found inside the gears of the tower, twisted and mangled. 
I froze at the mental image in my head. It was enough to make me feel sick. I could not even imagine how he felt. Did they fall in? Who are they? We do not know anything yet. None of them are local residents. I did not recognize their faces. At least, not what was left of them. We are treating it as suspicious. But until we investigate further, that is all I can say. As the day went on, more information was released. Sketches of their faces were shown, and not a single person said they knew them. Their identities were a mystery to us, yet we still felt shared mourning for their deaths. It was thought to have been a freak accident after checking various cameras and questioning local residents. Nothing suspicious was found. At four o'clock, the clock chimed four, though the hands remained motionless. I think by now it is clear where the saying came from. I do not know who was the first to say it, but for these few days it is all anybody would say when those chimes hit. Well, even a broken clock is right thrice a day. It was not exactly a joke, although by definition I suppose it is. Nobody ever laughed when the words were spoken. It was more like an absurd observation. The statement itself silently asked the question, but how is it possible for a broken clock to be right thrice a day? The next day, more police were in the area. I would have asked Rob what was happening, but he spent most of the day beyond where the public was now allowed to reach, tied up in the whole ordeal. This day sticks in my mind the most, because it was before any of us knew what was truly going on. But we knew enough to draw up theories. A lot of people thought that maybe they had found more evidence, perhaps even pointing to murder. A crowd of us were on the street of the tower, hoping for someone to inform us of anything. We fell silent at three o'clock as three chimes played. We went home without any new information, though our questions were partially answered in a town meeting called the next day. Rob stood in front of our small town hall with officers either side of him. Seeing more than a single police officer in our tiny village still felt surreal. As you all know, two days ago, three bodies were found in Witchford Clock Tower. As of now, the identities of these people are still unknown. After a few seconds of silence, Rob continued. Yesterday, many of you noticed higher police activity. It is always best to lay theories to rest before they get out of hand. I can confirm that three more bodies were found in the same positions as the previous three. So far, their identities are also unknown. We locked the tower and surrounding buildings down with police tape and 24-hour police surveillance. Muttering filled the air, but quickly stopped as Rob opened his mouth to speak again. This time... It seemed to take a while for him to get any words out. As of 90 minutes ago, three more bodies were discovered. This brings the death count to nine. Oh my God, those were the only words going through my head. We are treating this as a serial murder investigation. Given how small our village is, we have been permitted to prevent anybody from entering or leaving. If any exception is needed, please talk to myself or another officer and we will see what we can do. Thank you. As he walked away and back towards the clock tower, an uproar of questions were being yelled at him. They did not continue for long, as two chimes echoed through the streets. It was two o'clock. Rumours started. Of course, we are only human, and it is human nature to speculate. One person thought it was a psychological experiment, there are no bodies. That is why they will not show them. I can handle seeing a bit of gore. They would show us if it was real. Many started tracking down the original plans for the clock tower, in hopes of finding a secret entrance. How else would those final three bodies have snuck past the ongoing investigation? Some would whisper of ghosts. A spirit come to haunt our town. To taunt us showing us what would happen to us if we do not do its bidding. They were quickly laughed off, but perhaps only out of denial. 
Everyone had noticed the pattern. Of course, as I am sure you have. Two. The chimes. They started as five, then four, then three, then two. Were they counting down? It was the second day of this village-wide lockdown. July 6th. I had decided to head down to the clock tower at 12 hours and 55 minutes, at least as close to it as I could get. But as it turns out, I was not the only one with this mindset. The whole village was there. The entire life of our town gathered ironically around the only spot with any recent deaths. Tobias was nowhere to be seen. However, I figured the police were probably talking to him again, trying to get any information that they could. At twelve hours and fifty-nine minutes, the entire crowd fell silent. We were all waiting for the chime, unsure of what to expect. Our minds all focused on the same thing, the tower, still stuck at one hour and seven minutes. The seconds went by, getting us closer and closer to one o'clock. Have you ever seen a crowd of people physically deflate, fear and tension leaving the atmosphere as your own mind calms with it? It is fascinating to see, and it is exactly what I saw at one o'clock when no chimes were heard. Not a single one. It did not chime once, nor twice, nor thrice. Only a few minutes went by and people were already leaving the crowd when Rob stepped out of the tower. He whistled loudly to get everyone's attention. We were all dreading for him to inform us that three more bodies had been found. Instead, we learnt that only one had turned up. Somehow, this was so much worse than three, because this one was not a stranger. It was Tobias. No more bodies ever showed up after that. A few weeks went by, the lockdown was lifted, and no further evidence was ever found. The clock was eventually repaired, albeit now with no clockkeeper. Our atmosphere was the final death. It had become so bleak. It seemed to be over, but the memories would forever be with us. The fear imprinted in our minds. I was at work one day, staring at the now-working clock, when a customer walked in and handed me a wallet. This was on the floor outside. I am not sure whose it is. I am in a rush, so I thought I would hand it in here. I did not have time to speak before they left. I opened it up, and my heart sank slightly to see Tobias's face staring right back at me in a picture. I almost did not notice the note tucked into where the money should be. Looking back, I do not know why I did not consider this private information or immediately hand it to the police. Perhaps I was just too curious. Whatever the reason, I read it. The curse of Witchford has found me as it found my father fifty years ago. Witchford Clock Tower is more than it seems. Dig deep enough, and you will find rumours of it being an ancient gateway between universes. It is not... Witchford Clock Tower is the opposite. It is the cork in a bottle. It is the lock of a door. Witchford itself is the gateway. And the clock tower keeps ticking by, keeping the will of reality flowing as normal. Should the ticking stop, reality itself will not fall too far behind. It should be maintained and kept working. The clockkeeper is the locksmith of our world. All universes have their own. Ours happens to be at the heart of our village. I do not know what entity controls the towers across universes, but I do know that they require a sacrifice every fifty years. I missed my cue. On July 1st, I was supposed to die, along with every clockkeeper in every universe. But I was stupid. I did not believe what my father had told me. Once the bodies from alternate realities started showing up, I knew I had messed up. These clockkeepers had sacrificed themselves, and I was being shown my selfish ways. They were bleeding into our reality as a sign for me to follow them. The countdown, a sign of the end. As I write this, I'm getting ready to jump. The clock needs its keeper. The keeper is the one who holds the sacrificial curse. I am sorry to do this to you, but whoever is reading this, you are the new keeper. 
you have fifty years left ahead of you. If anything should happen to you before then, make sure you have someone new appointed. If the curse has no single bearer, I fear the entire village may be its bearer. To the new clockkeeper, good luck. I'm ashamed to admit this. I left town the next day. The gentle hum of the air conditioning overhead looped the same sound I had been hearing for the past four hours. The same sound I hear every workday, usually five days a week. Working in a quiet garden centre isn't bad. I'm not going to complain about things not being busy if the pay is the same, but it does get boring. It's a little busier in the summer months, but outside of that, I'm surprised the place even bothers staying open. The boss has a strict no-phones policy outside of breaks, so if there's nothing else to be done, I often find myself just standing at the cash register, listening to the familiar gentle hum, letting it hum as my mind hums with it, symphonizing our repetitive existence. I enter the building at eight o'clock in the morning and leave at four o'clock in the afternoon. Between those hours I am simply waiting, just waiting for the work day to be over. The humming continues. Despite the dull atmosphere in a store where almost nothing was moving, I still failed to notice the customer approach me until she spoke to me. I wondered if she thought I was possessed or asleep or dead. It certainly isn't normal for someone to be so distracted with so little going on. Then again, the things she said to me weren't quite normal either. Hello? Her voice made me jolt just a little as my eyes focused onto her. She was holding a small wishing well that we sell. It's a small wooden one and goes about up to your knees. Hi, madam. How can I help you? I tried to put on my customer service voice gradually throughout that sentence, morphing out of my holy shit I'm so bored voice. I want to return this wishing well, she spoke seriously, yet without missing a beat, continued with, It's not granting my wishes. I tried not to laugh. My intention was not to question or ridicule any of her beliefs. But come on, really? I cracked a smile and tried to cover it up by looking down at the product and saying the first thing that came to mind. Oh, should it? I immediately knew she wouldn't like that response. Of course it should. It's in the name. Truly shocked that she wasn't joking. I composed myself mentally and told myself that I've dealt with worse. Besides, the wishing well didn't look used. Our policy would still allow for a return. If she had the receipt... Do you have the receipt? No, I don't have the receipt. Of course she doesn't have the receipt. I'm sorry, but we can't offer a refund without it. I might be able to get you store credit. This is never the response that a customer wants. And it's never the response I want to give. Her face went red. That is ridiculous. What kind of establishment are you running? Technically none. I don't run the place. But I didn't say that. I know better than that. After a back and forth remaining in a similar tone, she asked me to get the manager, a request I had felt boiling up ever since she asked for the refund. Once you have a job like this, you really get a feel for the different types of customers. The manager, of course, told her the exact same thing that I did, because managers are often the ones setting these policies to begin with. They aren't going to magically bypass something that I could not. She accepted store credits in the end and seemed to go on her way. I wonder why she's returning it, my manager wondered aloud. She didn't mention to you. She says it's broken because it doesn't grant wishes. My manager chuckled as he walked away, presumably thinking I was joking. I didn't care enough to correct this thought. I stared at the well as the gentle hum became centred in my brain again. Being disrupted by the woman's return as she slammed a new well onto the counter. I'd like this one. I contemplated telling her it still wouldn't work, but I knew it wasn't worth the hassle. 
I let her use the store credit for the purchase, wondering why she even argued about the refund if she was going to use it immediately in-store anyway. This continued every day for weeks. Sometimes she would come in with the previous wishing well, asking for a replacement. Sometimes she would come in empty-handed and buy a new one. We eventually stopped allowing her to replace them, suspicious that she might be secretly harvesting material from each one for some kind of money-making scheme. We never found any evidence of this, however. Each return did visibly appear to still be in good quality. With each passing day she'd come back, looking more unkempt than the last. Her hair became thin, her skin developed patches of grey, her clothes became the same time and time again, showing no signs of being washed. The smell became unpleasant. Sometimes she would have emotional outbursts, yet other times she seemed emotionlessly calm. It got to the point that she wouldn't even speak. She'd just throw some money on the counter and pick up a well on the way out, sometimes humming as she did. Even this seemed to deteriorate, as her humming became more of a rattly creak. She mostly stopped looking at me, although her gaze would seem to pass right through me even when she did. Her visits became an eerie ritual, all taking place under the gentle noise of the air conditioning. As the weeks went on, her discoloured skin began to stand out to me more and more. She had a limp that developed seemingly overnight. I wish I had called an ambulance, or the police, even the fucking secret services at that point. She was unnatural. Being in the same room as her felt equal to being in a room alone, because nobody could possibly perceive her as human. She was not the same average lady who argued with me just weeks prior. I began to fear her. The atmosphere at work changed, knowing each and every day that I would have to see her complete this sad, repetitive routine. I felt the contrast when she eventually stopped showing up. My days went back to mindlessly listening to the gentle hum. That was until today, when a man entered the store. As he made his way straight for the counter, I could see his face being unusually sweaty for such a cold day. I wondered if he was in a rush or stressed. It immediately became apparent that the answer was both as he began describing the strange woman and asking if I had seen her. I'm her brother. She's been missing for days, he stared, waiting for a response. I'm so sorry to hear this. She's been here quite a few times recently. What did she buy? He spoke sternly but not angrily. There was a level of concern in his voice. I only noticed then that he was tightly holding a book. It was always the same thing. She would... He interrupted me. Was it wishing wells? I froze mid-sentence, my mouth still open slightly. He had tears in his eyes. I gently closed my mouth and nodded slowly. He silently allowed himself to cry, eventually speaking when he was able, her house is full of them, from so many different places. I don't understand what is happening. He placed the book on the counter as he attempted to compose himself. The book looked damaged, yet not at all dusty. Its origins looked ancient, though its use seemed frequent. On the front, in large golden printed letters, read The Well Diaries. The gold shine had all but vanished, leaving a rough, stained look. What's this? I asked, knowing it not to be the right time. My curiosity couldn't help itself. We don't know. He seemed hesitant to pick it back up, almost wanting to leave it behind. It has every wish she ever made. Most of them are make it stop or leave my soul. Some of them aren't even by her. A silence filled the air, making the hum apparent to us both. It seemed louder than usual, almost creaky. I tried to break the silence. I can show you the security footage of the last time she came in. He happily followed me to the back room, 
where I was able to show him. He was shocked at the sight of her and shed a few more tears, but thanked me greatly before leaving. He told me that he would inform the police and that they would probably drop by to check the footage. I told him I'd be more than happy to show them. Once he left, I began to scrub through the footage again. It's a smart camera system, so it automatically chops out all footage with no movement. I noticed activity from last night, long after the store had closed. Curiously, I clicked it, expecting for something to fall over in the wind or an animal passing by innocently. I didn't see an animal, but I saw something living. It was the woman, outside the store. She was crawling. The footage looked grainy due to the darkness, but there was no mistake about who this was. She was simply crawling around, occasionally peering through the windows of the store. Her proportions seemed off, especially her arms. They seemed so long and thin. The only thing about her that seemed remotely like her original self was her head. She crawled around the back of the building. As I switched to that camera view, there was no footage available. This means that no movement occurred around the back. Disturbed, I went outside and peered around the side alley. It was empty, except for the outside ducts of the air conditioning. They had been ripped off the wall and now lay on the ground. Feeling my heart drop, I calmly walked back to the door and locked the building from the outside. My manager wasn't in, so the building was empty. I began to patiently wait for the police, hoping they'd be arriving soon to ask for the footage. I stared through the window, trying to convince myself that there was a logical explanation. I noticed the book remaining on the counter. I hadn't noticed the man leave it. My eyes quickly darted to above the counter. Through the ducts that hum above my head every day, I spotted her. Only for a brief second. I'm not a religious person, but I prayed she didn't spot me.